This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. I can't reach it anymore. Stephen, can you see the committee room? I can see the committee room, yeah. Brilliant. We can hear you. What I'm going to ask you to do is if you can speak very loudly. Um, we have a number of members on teleconference. No problem. So there is a speaker here, but hopefully everything picks up. Can I just ask the members on teleconference? Can you hear Stephen? And they're all on mute. Yeah. Brilliant. Yeah. Brilliant. OK, so everybody just, if we speak really loudly, hopefully this will all work. Chair. Um, welcome to the 11th meeting of the Economy Committee. Um, and obviously, due to ongoing safeguarding measures in place in regards to COVID-19, some members are in uh, attendance through teleconference, and, and our witnesses today will be briefing the committee via um, video link. The, the meeting will be broadcast live as normal, and a recording will be made available on the committee's webpage on the Assembly website. Um, and if all members can mute their tablet devices by pressing F4 on your keyboard. Um, and I think, first of all, I think we would all maybe want to extend our, our condolences to those who have um, been bereaved as a result of COVID-19 and, and all those who are currently unwell. Um, and I think that we're, we're, we're all very mindful of that in terms of our, our deliberations and our um, uh, in terms of the evidence that we're hearing today as well. Um, item one on the agenda today is apologies. Um, and we have received apologies from Stuart Dixon, and Stuart has asked us to also highlight that he is the chair of the all-party group on social enterprise, and we are hearing evidence from social enterprise NI this morning. Um, there's no other apologies that we're aware of? No, no chair. Everybody's on. Anyone who's not physically here is on the teleconference. Okay. Thank you. Um, item number two then, um, the record of decisions that we made um, via correspondence are point 2.1 and 2.2 in your pack. Um, they are record of decisions of the 7th of April and the 31st of March. They're at page five and nine respectively. Um, our members contend that the record of decisions are an accurate reflection of um, our correspondence. Yes, yep. yes right. agreed. Thank you. Um, then point 2.3 and 2.5 on um, pages 14, 17 and 22 um, from the department summarising responses to COVID-19 related questions from the committee to the department. Um, are members content with those? Yep. Yeah. Thank you. Um, item three is chairperson's business and we have no um, items in that. No, so we're moving then on to item number four, which is our briefing for manufacturing NI on the economic impact of COVID-19 um, today's briefings, members, we are going to be trying to keep very strict timing because we have to finish by, by 12 to allow the room to be disinfected for the next committee. So we will be being strict with members today, which we aren't normally, um, limiting them to one question at a time and no opportunity for statements to be made. So if there's time at the end of the briefings, um, we will ask, uh, we will allow for further questions. But this briefing from, from Stephen Kelly um, needs to end by 10.40. Uh, so the clerk's memo is on page 27, and there's a written briefing from Manufacturing NI at page 32. Um, so I'd like to welcome Stephen Kelly, Chief Executive of Manufacturing NI, to our meeting this morning. Thank you very much for taking the time to, to be with us. Um, and if you would like to, to make your opening statement. Chair, thanks very much, and hello to all the members of the committee as well. As the Chair said, my name is Stephen Kelly. I'm Chief Executive of Manufacturing NI. I have been for the last six and a half years. I suppose the place to start is what was the community looking like on the 1st of March? Um, there was a very positive story. Manufacturing in many ways was leading the way in terms of the return to work. Uh, the vast majority of the jobs gained in the period from 2009 up until 2020. Uh, we're in our manufacturing sector, and obviously strong record numbers of sales, record numbers of exports, record numbers of external sales to elsewhere. Uh, if you look at the sector as a whole, we were the third largest subsector employment after retail and our health services. Uh, if you add in the, small, the smaller firms, less than 10 employees, we were sitting about 90,000 jobs. Uh, dominating, as I said, 
for sales and exports, and also dominating our research and well, development and activity. COVID has been an enormously difficult challenge for everyone, uh, members of the committee, people watching online, everybody at home. Uh, and that's no different for the manufacturing community as well. They've seen, in many respects, the markets disappear overnight. Uh, they've seen uh, difficulties in terms of receiving payments for the work that they've done. And in many cases, factories have actually closed down, hopefully on a temporary basis. I've shared with the committee so much in detail some reasons why a number of manufacturing facilities are still open, and those include the fact that they are essential, so they're providing services to frontline uh, staff and frontline activities. They're safe. Uh, in many occasions, the manufacturing sector has got ahead of other parts of the economy, and indeed, perhaps some of the, the health services, for instance. Uh, they also need to be in business now, because if they're not, uh, there won't be a business to return to uh, in a number of weeks' time once we overcome this health emergency. Uh, and they are also the only way in which many people continue to be employed. I have offered some evidence to the committee, some insights there around those issues, but also issues that are impacting in terms of funding, in terms of customer demand, etc. etc. And then the second part of my paper is uh, some results that we've received back from surveying the manufacturing sector back on the uh, first week of April. And what we saw there was the sector uh, at that point was largely closed down. We saw that uh, one in five firms were completely closed. But in addition to that, we saw that uh, saw that 60% of the firms had three quarters of their staff closed. 72% of the firm had within 50% of the staff on the And the firm would say temporary replacement redundancy. The scheme ordered quite redundancy for now. Then the challenge is to ensure that we can get as much of that sector back to the economic activity in order to ensure that those jobs do not turn into the dumping job. And that will be one of the tests of any recovery we receive and clear as to get this public health emergency. We also, in that paper, offered some insight into the challenges in terms of money, where almost four in five firms were using money for business to sustain <coughs> this period, uh, and some commentary on their experience with the banking system, and particularly civils, the chancellors, the various business production fund. Uh, and a more positive note, what we did find that about 12% of work had repurposed in order to collaborate with, with others, the word I can't say. Uh, and what we found is that we extrapolated that out probably about 600 firms. That's more than just over 100 that the best and I have identified. Probably in the reason of 600 firms that have changed what to do now in order to help deliver frontline services, whether those be the famous uh, drugs that are leaked to people. All of those with this class of block that like, took back in hours and But the, the sector is actually a challenge and offered their expertise, their, their staff, and their practices in order to assist uh, with this cycle. Uh, the papers also have some quick observations about what needs to happen next. One of the, the important ones for us is that we allow some manufacturing capability to move to other territories, uh, particularly in about the supply of materials and for health services. And I think that's one of the big tests out of all of this history, is that we need to put resilience in our supply that and not to rely on supply chain overseas. But I'll leave it there. Thank you very much, Stephen. Um, if I could just pick up on, on a, a few of your points. Um, the, the furlough scheme obviously opened this week for applications. Um, and I was just wondering how that has, how people have found that process um, so far. So you're, you're correct, Chair. At 8 o'clock on Monday morning, uh, the furlough scheme portal opened up from HMRC. It's largely been okay. There's been a few hitches, a few glitches along the way by the end of the process. But uh, most of the firms that we've spoken to in the last 48 hours have said that that process has largely gone pretty well. We know that the first application was made by 20 past eight, straight to the system. 
That's partly because we've done a lot of communication with the manufacturing sector. We've supplied them with the best information we could find so that they were prepared for Monday morning. They had all their details together. They had their logins. They had all their records in terms of their employees. They had uh, for phones more than 100 people. They had uh, an electronic file ready for uploading. Uh, so they, the first stage of the process were fine, which is getting the details logged with uh, HMRC. The deadline is tonight at midnight for our firms who are hoping to get paid in the month of April. So HMRC have committed that those details are uploaded by midnight tonight, that they will commit to paying within six days. And if that happens in the same way as the, the first phase has, then we create relief out there amongst the manufacturing the other people, of course. Well, that, that's really good to hear. Um, and you can keep us informed of how that, that progresses, if, if that would be OK. Um, just in terms of your point around, around fee bills, um, obviously there were some changes made to the scheme a couple of weeks ago. And I was just wondering, has the experience of businesses since then been different to what it was previously? Has there been more ability to take up those loans? It doesn't appear to be the case. That's not a criticism of our local banks, so we're clear. Uh, talking to the local banks, they, the rough analysis is that they're able to, about eighty percent of firms to support themselves through existing products, and about twenty percent which down into the civil scheme. Uh, this is policy being made in real time. It's difficult for everyone to try to keep up what's happening from Treasury, from HMRC, from Astor itself. And um, they're not going to get this right all the time. Certainly, the furlough scheme as an example. The final update was about 8 o'clock on Friday night, uh, despite the fact that the scheme was live on Monday morning. And the same thing has been happening. There have been changes in adjustment. Uh, that's been fed to the leadership of the bank, back the banks are perfect that and trying to provide that to other colleagues. Uh, and it's difficult to get. Uh, that process running smoothly. But I think the, the record is that out of the lending offered so far, four out of five is existing banking services, 20% through the seats. Again, uh, we would like the banks to be a bit creative around this. Uh, certainly, there appears to be a situation where the firms that are well done uh, are unlikely meeting the conditions that their bank themselves. So, and will need to be civil. Uh, and firms that are probably less well run could support them through their own product, push them down the civil scheme. So that seems unfair to me, where everyone's suffering the same problems that they have, or that uh, the banks have a lot of problems so far, they're able to support through products at a cost. Whereas the firms that the bank probably less well, less keen to support their own products, but they push the civils. Uh, and they're getting up. So there, there are still problems with it. There are issues that we the Chancellor of it uh, addressed, but certainly our experience so far largely been that uh, banks have been supportive of firms and trying to get the right products. Uh, there was a delay of one of our major industry banks, so we got approved for the last year or so. That has caused some, but I, I believe, you know, through the process of the reform. We lost it. All right. Thank you, Stephen, for that. Um, and I think that's something that we will we will pick up on. Yeah. If I could just ask one final question myself, and then I'll open up to, to members. It's just around the repurposing of um, businesses to, to go um, to help towards the likes of PPE, um, and what support has been there in terms of doing that from from the likes of Invest NI and through through the, the Department for Health in terms of um, reaching out and asking for for that um, repurposing. So the very first call we had of an offer uh, for manufacturers to repurpose to provide some support was on the 16th of March. So we had one we, we got wind on Friday the 13th of all days that, that perhaps something was beginning to, to really develop within the manufacturing community. And we prepared that weekend lots of information, the best that we could find at that point. Bear in mind there's a lot of stuff that's happened since. 
uh, and we, we issued out an email to the entire sector, not just our membership, but the entire manufacturing sector. Uh, my phone started ringing about 8 o'clock on that Monday morning, and the very first call was from a, a lady in Tannistown who makes uh, very high value I use dancing dresses and said, listen, I've got the capability, I have the staff, I have the equipment. We can do something. Just tell us what you need. Uh, and there was a delay, I have to say, in trying to find a list of what is required from our health services. Uh, that's, again, not a criticism, because we're all dealing with an enormously difficult situation. Uh, but we've, we've continually requested uh, uh, that the manufacturing sector step forward and ask them what they believe they can do, and there's been a very good response to that. Uh, where there's been in a kind of controlled manner, so bringing it in through Invest and I working on a collaborative basis with those uh, people there, it's been a very positive one. Uh, I think I think it's also important to say that a lot of the focus was initially on trying to find someone who could make. Sorry. Ventilators, Pictures. and Looks a lot like of the focus, not. understandably, was not because it sustains life. Uh, but the sector that we have here isn't necessarily fully equipped to, to make ventilators at scale. But we do have a lot of other capability within the manufacturing sector that would have been useful. Uh, in, in the round, positive, it's been a positive experience. Uh, there's a lot of people willing to, to offer help. People have stepped up. As they've stepped up in the community, uh, providing what support that they can, uh, and, and you know, I know that in the the challenges of the early days, it was very difficult for our health services, our directorate, and others to try to get a grip of what was required and who can actually supply either material or equipment or final product. Uh, but in the round, I think it's been a really positive experience where the sector has stepped up. And there's been buyers within the the public sector who had a need that they needed to fulfil. No, thank you very much for that, and I think it has been a very positive um, experience that that so many people have stepped up to the plate in terms of this, and I think that they all should be commended for for doing that. Um, I'm going to open it up now to to questions from members. Um, Shane McLaughlin, can you hear us okay? Hello, Sinead? Maybe she's still on mute. Sinead, can you hear the committee? Do you want to go on then, Gordon? Yeah, Gordon, go do you want to go on ahead? Right. Then uh, thanks very much, Stephen, for your uh, presentation. And uh, thank you for your input on a regular basis to, obviously, to your members and to the MLAs and the updates, which we found very useful and informative. So thanks for all your effort. Um, just in relation to the grants, the 10K grant has been uh, going reasonably well, and quite a lot of your members, I'm sure, have, have received it, and I appreciate... Uh, can you hear me? Hello? Sinead, we can hear you now. Gordon's just gone into his question Hello? first, and then we'll come back to you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay? Yeah. The 10K grant has been... So, Gordon's now in surround sound. <laughs> <laughs> right, just, yeah. Go on ahead, Gordon. So the 25k grant system has just been recently opened, as you you're already mentioned. Um, so, how do you find the, the grant system has worked? I think the initial idea of it was to help business to give them some. Uh, capital to deal with their existing overheads which were, were running whether they were manufacturing or not. Uh, how do you think that has, has gone in, uh, and uh, what are the gaps that you feel still need to be addressed for, for your members? Uh, Gordon, thanks. And You're right, we have shared almost on a daily basis the best information we can find from our, our own sources, our own interpretation of it, but also reaching out to professional firms like KPMG, Pinsett Masons and yeah, Lewis Towers Watson and others so that they have the best uh, knowledge and insight. We've been sharing that, broadcasting that as widely as we can. So I'm, I'm glad that the MLAs and members have found that useful too. Uh, the grant scheme wasn't initially available to manufacturers. Uh, very helpfully, the minister uh, opened up a small grant scheme, the 10,000 scheme, to our micro-manufacturers 
Good Friday. That was a tremendous relief to those smaller manufacturing firms that we have out there. The challenge with it though is that that money is available for firms with a LEV rates valuation of less than 2000 But as members will know, manufacturers uh, receive industrial rating. They receive it for a, for a very good reason. Unlike other parts of the economy, manufacturers can't commercialize every square inch of their property and they need large properties in order to do what they do, move things around, build bits of equipment, etc. etc. Uh, so there is a discount uh, for manufacturers. So the rates bill is this might be 30%. That's called an NE. So you have your, your main valuation is affected and final valuation is 30% of that. And those firms largely are SME. So the firms between 15,000 and say 45,000, uh, those also are, are smaller manufacturers. Those are people that work jobs, maybe three or four alongside them. They're still current from that grant system. We would very much welcome that the committee were able to call for that NEV1 number the reduced valuation because that back the true valuation the the property itself and uh, the assembly took back in 2007 offered and was still the rate because there was very good economic reasons to do that particularly the scale that somebody to be in order to contact is that to do and so we would very much like that group of people 15 and 45 thousand brought into the scope of the scheme the 25,000 schemes at all to any of the manufacturing sector. Uh, I know there's some debate around whether then the, the rates uh, discount for the 12 months period. Uh, of course, the business welcome that any helps, but I think specific is that have been told close hospitality, retail, some tourism businesses, uh, it would be first of one part of government must close down for business. Another part of government is saying that uh, we're going to send you a bill of taxation for the property to pay that money back. Uh, so we would welcome, of course, a bill of extension, but uh, I think that needs to be focused upon those set of most people. Okay, I want to go with Shanae. Thanks, Thanks Stephen. Great. Thank you, Chair. Thanks, Gordon. Uh, Shanae, can you hear us now? Okay. Yeah, can you hear me? Yeah, yes. go ahead. Okay, so um, the question I would uh, ask, uh, would ask Stephen is, you know, obviously we're thinking about how do we get out of this, how do we ease ourselves out of this. Has he explored it in, in a kind of um, a, a timeline, you know, on the optimistic side, coming out maybe quicker at the end of whatever, uh, a couple of months, or has he um, analysed, you know, um, that this might last another six to 12 months and what that would mean for the sector? And then, uh, in, the, in the least optimistic side, what happens if we don't get a vaccine or the vaccine doesn't work uh, and, and this is on for a lot, lot longer? Has he given an analysis of, of, of the various impacts to the sector on that on those basis? Thanks, Sinead. Thanks, Sinead. I, at the end of last week, we surveyed members again on when they were planning to return to production. Uh, what we found is that one in four were planning to go back uh, on Monday of this week, but the majority were planning to return on the week of the 4th or the 11th, so more than half of the sector were planning to go back uh, on those dates. Now, there's a health warning with this because it's quite a small sample. Uh, compared to the previous survey, which was uh, a larger sample. Uh, there's clearly a need for a plan for both restart and rebuild. Uh, there's a good piece of work that's been done by the forum established by the executive, looking at what they call the priority list and also a health and safety guidance for the workforce and workplaces. Uh, what's clear is that there's agreement there between employers, trade unions, health and safety executive, public health agency, labor relations agency, and others, uh, that, that a safe workplace is possible and a safe workplace should be guaranteed. So we've been sharing that work with uh, the sector over the last number of days, once it's been published. And, and on many occasions, we've had feedback from employers to say that not only are they meeting those standards, but they're going far in advance of them. 
So the test really is, uh, can you provide a safe work environment? And the second step in up and saying yes that we can. Uh, we all have experience ourselves in outside shops, camps or other places. Uh, the public are behaving in a very responsible manner. Uh, and we, we would hope that the workforce continue to do just the same thing with that. Uh, obviously, once you get into a shop, you may have viewed outside and took your distances. There is protection there for staff working in the shops as well. But customers, when they get in, are, are walking up and down through aisles, etc. etc. Et uh, and it, it is incumbent on us all to ensure that we take these new rules that we've been with us for quite some time and uh, put whatever mitigation and protections that we can into place in terms of the workforce. Uh, but the workforce also have to adhere to those rules as we do when we need work and when we're outside uh, in our normal lives, that's at retail or elsewhere. Okay. Thank you. Um, moving on then, John Stewart. Thank you very much, Chair. Stephen, thank you very much for your presentation. It's been very helpful. Um, there's a thousand questions we could probably ask, but we're only allowed one at this stage. If I had to look towards a recovery plan, um, we know that Wales has introduced the Welsh Economic Resilience Fund with £500 million in there, with up to grants of £100,000. Um, how do you see a Northern Ireland version of that potentially being um, mapped out and um, that would um, have a positive impact on the sector that you represent? John, thanks. We, uh, we, we have a number of things that we're beginning to feed into to government who are beginning to sensitively look at what a rebuild plan look like. One of the important things I think for us is that we have been sharing with membership that uh, in the furlough period, people can continue to train. So what are they trying to do now in order to improve the skills and capabilities of their workforce so that then we can get back to full production that people are much more productive? I think we need to use this period to invest in our productivity and not just in terms of getting people back to work. The second thing I would say is that uh, back to that point around the repurposing. We do have a requirement of the community to ensure that we have resilience of the supply chain. So what are the opportunities to, to look at people with capability out there to help them equip them or to supply the right materials or the right type of equipment? Uh, and use government to define, not just in terms of plans, uh, to support the people of the The third thing about that is probably creative, uh, which is we have, as a community, largely a, a culture, a very sharp shock in terms of cultural change, in terms of how we should behave as a community, and then when we're like engaged in the as shops, right, for a lot, whatever the case may be, we ask people to stay at home, and they've largely done that. I, I think a month ago, we probably thought that would be unlikely. I think a month ago, we probably thought that people wouldn't have behaved in the way that we've asked them to be. Uh, and maybe we should be looking at if we don't know that we can change the culture of a community. Uh, yes, extreme circumstances, is, but what can we do as a as a an economy, as a executive? Can we invest in every house even a basic connection and some sort of connected device? The cost of that would be that we would be sharing good, uh, good training material for in that household. Well, that's around entrepreneurship intelligence, creativity, uh, as well as messages, of course. Uh, and if we did start to be really positive, useful training opportunities with the, the public at large, we'd probably find that we could create a new culture here. One's very positive, not and real. It's very creative, community-focused, well, as we, we continue to be. Uh, and I think that we look very creatively and that we have to be left with. I mean, we kind of took that example, that cultural change and managed to deliver quite quickly out into everything in Northern Ireland. That ended up being a very positive outcome, um, but obviously a very different circumstance of them. Thanks, Stephen. Stephen. Um, and that, that I think is something that we need to reflect on is how we, we recover and what we want to achieve on the other side of this. Um, Gary, can you hear us okay? I can be chair. I hope you hear me. Yeah. Um, thanks, Stephen, and thanks to Manufacturing and I for their work and the lobbying and the, the work that they do behalf of the manufacturers in Northern Ireland. 
difficult for the workforce to come back. Uh, the, the workforce, we're all consuming this daily uh, diet of COVID uh, news and it is very, very concerning for us as individuals. Uh, uh, it's very concerning for the workforce as well. So the first thing is the, the workforce needs to understand that, uh, that the, the workplaces they're going back to are safe. And uh, we need to signpost that early so that people are preparing themselves to return to work. Uh, work also needs to be returning in a staged manner. So what we're saying to employers is don't bring everybody in all the time. Those who can hope to continue to work, from, look at your shift pattern, etc., 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 so that it's a state return to work. All that everybody returning on time. And indeed, we're looking at. Uh, a staggered return, so that supply, small the ones that returned yesterday or Monday, sorry, were largely you know, smaller guys in the supply chain. The, the larger manufacturers that uh, later on, a couple of weeks time, the middle of May, so that there's a that staggered uh, to this as well. So we, we do this in a controlled, safe way. What I would say in terms of is that we we've a small regional. I mean, really, the external sort of income comes from sales to the rest of the UK, sales to the uh, world, for uh, export. Uh, and our manufacturing sector has led the way on that. 60% of our export manufactured goods uh, is the opposite of the UK, where manufacturing is So we really depend upon that external source of income. It creates really vibrant. And middle spirit that in our map and, and even here up in dairy, uh, manufacturers in the dairy strip area, second largest employer after retail. So, so we do require a focus, I believe, on uh, people who are in external markets, that external income, in order to feed that supply chain to their, their smaller manufacturers, largely depend on export. In order to supply, uh, in order to get that, that source of income. Uh, so, to me, it is uh, ensuring that export markets are supported and people are able to access those markets. But that's not going to be easy. So, we have people creating machinery in Mid Ulster uh, who've gone out to market places across the globe, but the, the staff can't make it to that place to commission that machinery because it has to be controlled down. Uh, we have uh, members who are supplying stuff in the construction sector, GB, our connections with GB are uh, restricted at the moment. And even if we can get like, across them, the accommodation has been closed and down from hotels, etc. Et so it's difficult for them to service those clients. But in, in all of this, the world is going to move, move the world has moved into COVID at different paces and will remove itself. At different paces as well. And we need as much agility that we can to invest in our partners, others, support those who can move 
parts quickly in return quickly, but also those that, that have to wait a bit longer. Because at the end of the day, customer demand is back to the place that we're rather than some in terms of cash assembly or others. Thanks, Stephen. Um, John O'Dowd, can you hear us? Yeah. Go ahead, John, if you want to ask your question. Hello? Yeah, John, go ahead. Yeah. John's very shy, isn't he? Yeah, Can you hear us? Maybe does John? Oh, he's having difficulties. Does he want to text, at his does he want to text the question? Do you want to text the question to us, John? Just having some technical difficulties there. John's having trouble at his end. Yeah. Chair and Peter, I think you're doing particularly well with the technology. This is a first for us all, and uh, I have to congratulate you and your colleagues for just keeping it, getting it up and running and keeping it running. Yeah. Stephen, we're just we're just waiting to see if there's if there's a question coming in from John O'Dowd. Um, we're just having some technical difficulties in in reaching him. He's typing, so. Oh, he's typing. Yeah, he's, he's typing. typing. Don't miss no long one. Okay, he says no. Go ahead, um, Stephen. Just, I, I'd like to, to echo uh, Gordon's comment as well around the information that you have been providing, and, and I have said that to yourself previously that it is has been really useful um, and appreciate um, that. And um, just if there's anything further that you want to share with the committee over the time ahead, that, that we would be very much welcome of that. Um, and we we are here to to listen to you. Um, thank you very much for your time this morning. And, thank you, um, Chair. It's all the best of luck. Thanks very much. Good luck, everyone. All Thanks, Stay safe. All the best. Thank Thanks. you. All right. So what do we so do now? So we now move on um, and contact Joanne well, Stewart okay. from <coughs> the Northern Ireland Tourism Alliance. Two minutes. Yeah, I need two minutes. So that will just be happening now. Okay. Are we good on that one, Sinead? Yeah. We're just we're just lining it up. There's okay. just that little bit of delay. Technology's a wonderful thing, but it's not always smooth. <sighs> Sinead Ringham. Ring 30 and he's setting up the next Skype connection. Is it? That's great. Thanks very much. Thank you. Bye. Looks like John's back online. Just for members on the, the telephone conferencing, um, we're just waiting for the NI Tourism Alliance Skype connection. And it looks like it's coming through now. So if you want to do the same thing again, uh, whereas if you if you want a question, if you just come through on the Skype or the WhatsApp group, there we have Joanne. Joanne, can you hear us? I can. Yes. Can you see us? Um. Just. No. Oh. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Well, I can see four cameras. No people. Oh, okay. We're, we're going to proceed anyway, Joanne. I'm just going to hand over to the chair. Good morning, Joanne. I hope you're well. Um, thank you. For, I am. Thank you. thank you for joining us this morning and for taking the time. Um, if you would like to go ahead and give your, your briefing and then members um, will have an opportunity for question at the end. Thank you. 
And so I'm Joanne Stewart, Chief Executive of the Northern Ireland Tourism Alliance. And we represent members across accommodation, hospitality, direct marketing organisations, transport, air, road and sea, attractions, tour guides, and we work very closely with Council, First and I, and Tourism Ireland. So um, I provided a, a briefing this morning. I don't have a chance to read. So I'll just very quickly go through the main points. So tourism has been one of the most um, sustainable uh, and resilient, successful parts of the economy. And before COVID-19, we would have had 3 million visitors in Northern Ireland. Um, a visitor spent in excess of £1 billion pounds to the economy. Um, 70% of this is from visitors outside of Northern Ireland. And almost 60% of that then outside Belfast. And the sector for the interest supports over 65,000 jobs. And again, this is a whole region with 70% of the jobs outside of Belgium. Tourism has been on a growth trajectory for the last decade, being 35% growth from 2014 to 2016. And we had ambition to double the size of tourism by 20 now, the impact of COVID-19 has been um, catastrophic on the industry. I've been providing regular updates to the committee, updates that I've provided to our members with regards to how the, the situation has evolved. So basically, tourism has been hit, was hit first. And we initially saw the in February with the cancellation from the Asian market. And then tourism technically came to a stop in March with the surge of relations due to the escalation of COVID-19. So unlike any other part of the economy, um, tourism business is picked at the quietest part of the tourism calendar. So basically businesses are, um, are at lower reserve, lower cash flow, and we're ready to start spring and summer. Um, we also are expecting a, a record breaking year following the success of the Open last year and the launch of our and Embrace Giant Europe. So businesses have invested in this was expected. So tourism has forefront of the economic act. With income dropping to zero within a matter of days. And unlike other sectors in the economy, the alternative to um, or generating from an industry has not been an option. So tourism accounts for up ten percent of the job um, in our industry. So the impacts across the whole. Now with regards to the um, obviously, there has been a lot of stuff been announced both by the UK government um, and by the executives. But the challenge has been length of time between an announcement and actually getting cash in. There's been no income coming in. The businesses are still trying to cover maintenance, finance payments, utilities, customer refunds, and that has been a real challenge. Or at their lowest level. Um, what has been good now is we're starting to see some of that support getting through. The ten thousand pound um, was still fifty percent are still to be distributed, but they're half that past up. The coronavirus job retention, which has been a lifeline, is this protect job. Obviously, has now opened up payments on that by the. 25k grant. Um, obviously, we're not the um, opened on Monday, um, but expecting payments for 15 working days. Um, so that that one has 
a very long lead time from its announcement on the 19th of March until businesses are actually getting built. We've got the self-employed which is really important for smaller experienced providers, tour guides, etc. Um, again, is it time um, or block on that money being received? So we've had a number of uh, self-employed people who rely on universal data while that comes in. The business rates holiday, Waterville rates delayed, the deferment of VAT and PAY you think have all been very, very much welcomed by them. And also, from a banking perspective, the coronavirus business scheme has strict reviews with regard to who can access it. We have had one or two stories, um, but a number of businesses are still struggling to get that support back. But this is a situation. The tourism and I recently done a survey of businesses within tourism and over a third are not eligible for any of the grant support that has um, already appointed. So that is businesses who are renting and are there a business bed and breakfast, catering for their rates with domestic food, not eligible. And businesses with a rateable value £1,000, which would be the majority of the hotel sector. So we're looking forward to hearing what the um, £3 million emergency fund that has been allocated, what the criteria would be. Again, that was announced on the 10th of April. We've had no further information. We think the financial impact on the tourism industry will be at least about 500 million, which is 50% of what the figures were from 2018. That's a very, there's a more work going on to get a more accurate figure, but it's, at this point, that's the biggest case we're looking at. And then going on to the re rebuild, we're starting to have those. Tourism is a major theater across our region. Joanne, okay. Joanne, can I just ask you to pause? Yeah. Joanne, the, the sound quality isn't great. Um, there, there's a lot of interruptions. We've sent you through um, details for joining, an email for joining our teleconference. We think the sound on that might be better, so you can stay on picture. But if you can yep. dial through on the instructions we've just emailed you, then that should improve the sound quality. We can see you really clearly, but it's just the um, the sound keeps interrupting. Yeah, it gaps. So if right. you if you use those details and ring through on our teleconference, we try and work ahead with that, but we can still see you. Yeah, we can okay. we can make out what you're saying here, but I think it's. I think it's very difficult for the teleconference guys. So if you if you follow those instructions and then we'll see where we go from there. Yeah, it just doesn't come. Yeah. She'll need to mute the sound on the Skype. Just thinking that. Otherwise, we're going to get double barrel. Double. But I'm pretty sure she'll. Joanne, know. while you're listening in, can you mute the sound on your computer? Yeah, she has. See her. Really see technology. Yeah. Oh, she knows what she's doing. <laughs> yes. Hmm. 
for your help on anyone's it's streaming. It's quite involved, really. <laughs> <laughs> Joanne? Yeah. Yep. Hello? Yep. Hello. Go ahead. It's a bit echoey now, so... Just speak really loudly. Okay, so just finish off then with the recovery and rebuild. Yeah, Tell please. her to run through that again. <laughs> what, what do you want me to do? Just keep, keep going and then we'll go to questions. Right, okay. No, that's fine. We'll, we'll go to questions. Thank you very much, Joanne. Um, I suppose I'd, I'd just like to ask, or to start with asking about those who have so far been missed out for support. And um, I suppose it's something that has been um, highlighted to the committee from various different groups and sectors who, who are being missed out. Those with no premises, the likes of the B and Bs, as you've mentioned, um, those whose businesses are above the fifty-one k and AV, um, and who have seen very little in terms of support. Um, I suppose those with no premises um, haven't seen any kind of intervention so far because they're not getting the benefits of the likes of the rates relief. Um, and just to, to kind of hear the impact of that, obviously, is is great. Um, but what sort of interventions do you think are necessary for, for those people? Obviously, we have the, the hardship fund, and, and you mentioned yourself about 
um, needing to see what kind of criteria that that would um, have. Have you have you thought about what 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 the ask would be there? So what we have um, we, we have suggested something similar to the um, the Welsh Resilience Fund, um, and obviously that came out um, a number of weeks ago. Um, and, um, and what that is to do is to provide grants to those who are not currently covered by the grants that are related to business rates. So um, obviously since then there have been the 40 million that has been announced. And what we've been asking for is what is the criteria going to be for that? We are hoping that there will be grants um, that will be provided and we've been feeding in the sort of businesses that have not been able to avail of grants so far. And there's also some process, and I'll give you one example of a, of a business. Um, so a catering business um, has five different sort of self-catering um, uh, premises that are each rated individually. Um, was not able to avail of the £10,000 grants because they have more than three premises but aren't able to avail of the 25k grant because none of those premises are over the 15k. So there are, there are also you know, a lot of nuances within this and a lot of, lot of the challenge has been that the process of the thinking from the department's perspective is not being shared with industry. We're not, even though we're feeding information in, we're not really getting that collaborative approach on, on how we can make sure that we, we can address most of the um, issues. We obviously appreciate that um, you know, it's not possible to support every single business, but we want to make sure that we can support as many businesses as possible. No, no, I think that that, that is, that's a fair point. Um, I, I do think that there there probably is space for like a more collaborative approach, and I, and I don't know what that would look like, whether it be a stakeholders forum or something like that. That that might be useful if we, we could maybe. Yes, and, and being able to engage with those who are actually developing the process. Yeah. I have to say the the policy that we have in place for the department is excellent, but it's where where the actual processes are being developed. Um, it, it's not. It, it's not very transparent in, in how that's happening. Yeah, and I suppose there there is a recognition of the support that has been made available is quite blunt in terms of you know the, the parameters that have been used. Um, and I, I do think there is there's room for that type of conversation, and that needs to happen as well. Um, if I could just ask a couple more quick questions to yourself. Um, obviously. Um, we had a briefing last week or the week before in our pack from Tourism Ireland um, around kind of looking at the, the approach to the recovery and the, the planning ahead as well. And, and um, given kind of the all-Ireland nature and like you, you mentioned yourself, the, the, um, the barriers that are there to, to, to travel kind of outside of the island, um, how is that engagement going with, with colleagues in the south and in terms of the, the work of Tourism Ireland and, and yourselves um, to, to, in respect of the future planning? Yes, we've already started those discussions. So um, I'm part of the, um, sort of the, the marketing group um, for Tourism Ireland, which includes Tourism Northern Ireland. Um, and so we've been, been having discussions around what the messaging will need to look at, the timing of um, the promotion. So for, you know, obviously Tourism Ireland are promoting into GB and into international markets. And we know that that will probably be the second or third phase of the recovery. So there's going, we need to think around what the messaging will be in the meantime, um, so that people are keeping Northern Ireland and Ireland at the front of their minds um, for travel, but it may be later on in the year. Um, so part of the, um, the task force, um, the, the tourism um, recovery task force that we've asked for, is obviously looking at that marketing and promotion of Northern Ireland as a destination and funding of tourism, Ireland, tourism Northern Ireland is an important part of that. Um, we never really had the level of funding that we would like um, and I think given the, um, the challenging sort of situation that we're in, it will also be very competitive. Um, you know, there's, um, obviously all destinations um, have faced this challenge of the, the, of the global uh, pandemic. Um, so it's, it's how do we really differentiate ourselves when we go to oh, thank you for that. Um, I think Claire Sugden is our first question. Claire, can you hear us? Uh, yeah. Uh, uh, thanks, Chair. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Um, I'm Claire Sugden. I'm the Director of Tourism Ireland. Um, I'm 
Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Joanne, for everything so far. There, there's so much in there. Um, you alluded to some of the aspects of what you'd like to see in a recovery plan for the sector. Um, part I didn't get part of it. Perhaps you could recover that for me. And just one other aspect on the grants, the £10,000. We're being told by the department that the, the land share of these have been distributed and it's just a few that haven't been because of technical difficulties, whether that be in registering for them or the wrong bank details. That's not what I'm hearing from people in the sector. Can you give me a rough figure on what you think of the £10,000 grants for those who are eligible have actually received them and what are they being told by the department when they contact them about that? Okay, well, I'll just cover that one first, if that's okay, John. So there was an update from the First Minister yesterday on the number of um, the 10 guys. 10k grants that had been paid, which was just over 16,000. We know that there are 27,000 businesses eligible, and also that was before the um, smaller manufacturing organisations were added in, um, which was announced on the uh, just before the 20th of April. So my estimation is that there is, um, you know, uh, roughly 50% of those grants that have been distributed. And again, it's a mixed message with regards to people within tourism. I know some who have got it. I know some that haven't. I know some that haven't even received an email. Um, so there is a mix there. Um, and, um, you know, that information is being fed through. But for me, it's 50%. Okay. Thank you. I thought. Okay. Um, with regards to the tourism reco recovery support package, um, really, it's a number of things within that. First is the tapering of the job retention scheme. So that has been extended to the 30th of June, which is great. Um, but tourism, because we, we're not going to be able to open immediately at the same levels prior to COVID-19, um, we need the ability to um, bring staff back on on a phased approach. So we're asking for um, a sort of specific sector support to, um, to extend the job retention scheme. I mean, obviously that's uh, under the UK government. Um, we're also asking for an extension for um, the business rates holiday from three months to 12 months for tourism, hospitality and parts of uh, retail. Um, 
We also are looking for some um, grant support um, with regards to tourism businesses developing new business models for the new world that, that we, we will be in and obviously refining the product to meet the consumer needs um, and maybe some incentive promotions, so promotions to encourage people to get out and, and um, support um, the local tourism industry. We also need some insights research around consumer sentiment and barriers to travel and um, obviously a marketing and promotion plan um, of Northern Ireland as a destination and we're hoping that we would see obviously our Northern Ireland executive and our MLAs you know encouraging people to holiday at home and um, this year and really support um, local tourism. Yeah okay thank you for that John appreciate it. Thank you. Um, Gordon. Thanks, Chair, and thanks, Joanne, and uh, we appreciate your input and all you, your efforts to date in trying to resolve a lot of the, the issues, and we are aware of the gaps that have been mentioned in the grants. Changing the subject, the air connectivity and the impact of that on tourism, you mentioned it earlier. Uh, yeah. How significant is that going to be? Obviously, the summer season will be, incoming summer season will, I assume, be significantly impacted, but Running for you know going forward, how do you see uh, that uh, impacting on our tourist uh, business and obviously uh, the whole economy? And yeah, um, it is going to have a significant um, impact, as you say, for the whole economy, not just um, tourism. Um, GB is our largest, or has been our largest market, and the majority of people coming from GB are flying. Um, now, we do have a number who would fly into Dublin, um, but they will fly direct into Belfast. With the collapse of Fly B, we saw our capacity reduce between 25 and 30 per cent um, for flights into, uh, into GB. So, um, now, obviously, with COVID-19, um, aviation has been significantly um, impacted, and so there's also part of how they are going to build back up um, their capacity. But um, from a regional perspective, um, we need to do everything to ensure that Belfast um, and, and Derry is seen as a location where um, airlines want to have routes. So that's why we are calling again for the abolishment of air passenger duty on short haul flights. We're also um, asking for support um, for an air route development fund um, to really encourage airlines, you know, to think um, about um, Belfast and Derry um, as routes. But at the same time, we also, you know, as part of the new um, decade um, document, there was uh, the high speed rail links, um, you know, between Dublin and Belfast. Um, and we would love to see something where there is a much uh, quicker um, route for people to come from Dublin Airport um, up, to, uh, up to Northern Ireland. So it is really important. We are going to, I mean, I say international travel, we think, um, you know, will really not begin to come back until the end of the year. And this all depends on how the aviation industry itself um, rebuilds um, after uh, COVID-19. Great. Thanks, Joanne. Thanks, Chair. Thanks, Gordon. Um, I have a question from Sinead McLaughlin that she has sent through, so I, I'll just read it out to you, um, Joanne. Um, so Sinead says the tourism sector has been the first hit and will likely be the last to emerge, and it's highly likely that the 2020 season will be over before the crisis is. What analysis have you done within the sector to assess the um, sustainability of many of the businesses, as I suspect we will have major issues, particularly with family-owned businesses? Um, well, as I say, we've done a very um, sort of, you know, sort of quick looking at um, what the figures were. Um, well, the, the latest figures we have are for 2018, um, and understanding, you know, that um, you know a lot of Q1, Q2, and Q3, um, you know, have been significantly impacted. So we think it, it's certainly going to be around 500 million um, of an impact to the industry. Um, there is, you know, further um, research being done. Um, with regards to really getting the, the more detail um, behind that. But also until we really understand the recovery um, and how we're going to come back, um, it's, it's very difficult to say at the moment what that impact will be. Um, at the moment, we know a third of uh, businesses are not getting any support through the grants. Um, and that's very concerning because these are smaller businesses 
um, and will not have the capacity to see themselves through. So that's why the 40 million is really important. Um, but also, depending on how we're going to open, there are financial uh, viability questions that need to be answered. Um, you know, with regards to can you cover costs by opening with social distancing? So those are the type of um, questions um, that we are working our way through. And I'd like to think in the next, you know, two to three weeks, we'll start to see more of the detail of, of what that needs to look like. And again, that's why the, the Tourism um, Recovery Task Force is really critical because we need to have industry and government working together. This is, you know, we need to have um, policy people working with the industry to really understand how that, how that could look. Thank you. Um, Christopher? Hello there. Thanks very much for your presentation and all the information contained within it. It's very useful. Um, in terms of the recovery of the sector, you mentioned encouraging people to stay cation effectively. Could you tell me what you think a, a public campaign encouraging people to do that would actually look like? Um, well, I, I think that there's um, you know a, a campaign about really exploring you know Northern Ireland. Um, so um, more about you know what are the sort of different experiences and um, what we want as examples of um, you know people that are doing that whether that's maybe um you know some celebrities we could also um you know obviously with people you know who have been doing such a fantastic job within the nhs is there any way that we can you know support um those um individuals and i know that's something that's being looked at uh, through visit britain for example um so there's there's many it's really about encouraging but also um about showing the uh, breadth of, um, of experience that there is um, in Northern Ireland. But the other thing is about ensuring that people feel that they're safe um, when they go to places. Um, and that has to be part of the messaging. Um, and then we would want our, our um, you know, political leaders to obviously encourage as well you know, people to, to get out and, uh, and explore what's on their doorstep. Um, but uh, there, are, there are better minds than mine, Chris, that would be able to come up with um, sort of the marketing campaign. But it really is about showing what's out there, showing what is available you know, on your doorstep um, and, um, and giving examples of, of what a great time people can have. Yeah, I think um, the, the tourism sector is so broad and so diverse. And I, I know like, I, I certainly have been contacted by, by various different types of business models you know everything from tour guides to, to hostel owners to, to language schools um that are all you know facing difficulties and many of them have been missed out and i think we really do need to to see that more collaborative conversation and i think that's something we can explore yeah, with the, with the department um, and joanne if i could just also maybe ask um i guess there will be maybe some um countries who will begin to come out of um, the, the emergency measures ahead of ourselves and I was just wondering what kind of um, analysis is maybe being done or, or best practice maybe being gathered from, from elsewhere in terms of um, how we emerge from this and in the longer term. Um, yeah, so I'm um, part of the UK Tourism Industry Council. We actually have a call this afternoon, um, and that is um, with regards to the recovery. Um, we want to see this at a, at a UK level as well as at a, a, an, an Irish level um, and, um, and ensure that we, are, that we are part of that. So we're able to get um, you know, best practice, but also understanding some of the challenges um, from you know, those businesses within the UK. We're also looking at um, our sort of competitor destinations, you know, across Europe um, and internationally, and those that may be ahead of us with regards to the um, the, the outbreak of, of COVID-19 um, and and how they're um, approaching. And you know, as I said, this is why it's really important that industry are part of this conversation, um, because at the end of the day, industry know what is and what isn't achievable, um, and how they can. Um, innovate and um, you know change uh, their business model um, to support um, you know what is going to be um, a changed world for all of us when we when we come through this. Thank you, John O'Dowd's coming in for a question. Can you hear us, John? Hello, can you hear me? Okay. Yep. Yep. Uh, John, uh, thank you uh, for feeding the committee today. Unfortunately, I did miss 
the majority of your presentation just, just be the design quality issues. But I have read uh, the papers you've sent to the committee uh, and the question and answer session thus far has been very informative. I, I, in particular, the proposal to have a graduate, graduated uh, decline in relation to the furlough scheme work would, would particularly help uh, the tourism sector. I think that's something that needs to be taken on board uh, and looked at seriously in the time ahead because, as everybody has said, the tourism sector has been hit particularly bad by this. But I just want to make a point, and I make this to every tourism representative that has come before the committee since I've joined it. Um, can we assure that Loch Ness is included in whatever promotional <laughs> materials and program of work we <laughs> have moving so. forward? Because uh, I, I think it is dual in the crown that we don't, we haven't to date promoted enough or, or mm -hmm. uh, ensured that it is in people's minds when they're planning, whether it's a longer holiday or a day trip or whatever it may be. Thank absolutely, you. John, front and centre. But I think that you're absolutely right. What we need to do is identify, you know, these places that people haven't thought of, and you know, as well as Loch Ness, there's, there's lots of other places as well that are easily accessible, um, and uh, and that has to be part of of any campaign. So I I take that on board. <laughs> Thank you. Good answer. <laughs> Thanks, um, Joanne. I have one final question here from Sinead McLaughlin um, that I, I'll read out to you. Um, Sinead says, if we're to promote staycation on the island, does your sector believe that we need to have a joined up approach in relation to tourism COVID policy? It may be difficult to have a marketing campaign in both parts of the island if we don't have similar testing and tracing procedures. I think that's got to be part of the um, discussion. I think the most important thing here is about ensuring that staff and visitors um, are working um, and, and able to you know, experience tourism in a safe way. Um, and, um, and, and so we, we need to take that into consideration um, of, of what that means and what is required. Um, and we've got to learn from you know, what's going on um, in, in the South. Um, you know, I've just seen a, um, a comparison between the amount of testing obviously being done in the UK and the amount of testing um, being done in um, Ireland. Um, you know, so it is, and that's why I know that you know there's um, close working between the Department of the Economy and DTAS, and obviously the um, you know the the minister um, with with her counterparts uh, both across the UK but um, in Ireland as well. So it, it is something that needs to be considered because I think that is what is going to give consumers confidence um, that they they can travel and, and go out and, and experience what we have to offer. Thank you. Um, Joanne, thank you very much for, for taking the time to talk to us this morning and um, we will reflect all of the points that you've made back to, to the department. Okay, thank, thank you very you much. Thank Here's you, Joanne. Um, while well, well, we're getting the next one, I think it would be useful if we could maybe um, put some proposal to, to the department around the potential for a stakeholder forum or some sort of engagement body that enables the, the information that, that they have to share and all of the, the various gaps and things that have been highlighted to be discussed and to help shape it. Chair, I think it's something that was mooted as part of potentially putting together the strategy. Um, so certainly it's, it's a, a good yeah, time. The strategy urgently. will now have to evolve very differently. But in terms of developing yeah. the hardship fund and proposals, yeah. um, mm. maybe a more urgent approach to that? Sure, what might be helpful um, is if we gather up everything we get today and then we look at doing a, a, a committee um, oh. Microsoft Teams thing. Mm -hmm. Where we can get a good discussion done and, and refine and see then you know what we want to take to the minister so we look at options for timings i know everybody's crazy busy at the minute and they've got wall-to-wall -wall video meetings and all sorts of other things um but we'll try and find a slot just to get members able to talk about that okay. um just to kind of refine down what we're hearing so that the, the proposals are are um you know, there's good consensus behind it so we'll we'll start working on that, that would be once we stop today and we'll get a time for that and there's Colin. Good morning, Colin. Can you hear us? Yeah, I can hear you. Yeah. Oh, that's nice. Good loud. Good loud. Um, you're good, good and clear. Um, thank you for, for taking the time to, to join us this morning, Colin. Um, and, and just to, as before, um, 
if you would give your opening briefing and then we will open it up to members for, for questions and we're actually doing quite good on time this morning so no everybody's been really good. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks Colin. Okay, thank you committee for the invitation to sit here today. Um, congratulations on getting it all together at the end. Um, technology is not, uh, not used at times but uh, it should be commended. Um, as always, we're very keen to, to raise the awareness of the social enterprise sector, particularly at the moment in regards to the issues which are uh, facing the sector with the impact of COVID-19. So I sent through some background information on the sector in the paper. Um, that is for those of, uh, who maybe aren't aware of what social enterprises are, the sector. So it's a diverse sector as we've seen. But the main thing is the only difference with a social enterprise to an SME do with their profits. Social enterprises um, redistribute the profits back in their social mission, not for the benefit of our shareholders. So uh, up until sort of start of March or so, it was a strong sector, seeing positive growth in the sector, um, heavy stakeholder engagement. Um, and the first part of the paper today just talks to the roles of the social enterprise sector. Um, the one thing to be very keen to mention is there are businesses, they are businesses, like other, like other businesses, have the same challenges around cash flow and economy, um, and they make their money from self goods and services. So you know, there, there are lots of benefits for the community. Um, our recent survey showed that there are just short of 25,000 people employed in the sector. We'll see 143 organisations. We took over 980 million, almost a billion pounds in total. Sinead. And our economic contribution is around about 600 million. Colin? So, Colin, yes. can I just ask you to pause there? The sound quality has deteriorated as you've gone along. We're, we're okay. going to email you. <laughs> Um, joining details for our teleconferencing, which which seems to be working better. Uh, we are switching back to old technology. Um, so we can still see you, and if you mute the sound on your computer so we don't get feedback, but Sinead Kelly from the team is now emailing you joining instructions for our teleconference. So once you get those, if you ring in, preferably on a landline phone, but if not, a mobile will work. And if you just mute, mute your computer so we don't get feedback. Chair, I think going forward we just dispense with the video link. link. It's a lovely idea, but mm. it's just back to that 90s teleconference phone, I think. There were no technicians available. Like the, it's not just it's not like that. You're, you're dependent on a Wi-Fi connection that is mm. really variable. This is all over. I can tell you, I have a funny feeling some people who think they're going to be building our 5G Wi-Fi network won't be. <laughs> <laughs> Do you know what? Sometimes old wind-up technology just works better. Yep. I can see why now um, teleconferencing was, was kind of the priority. Which also means if members won't. <coughs> Hello, Colin. Can you hear us? Hello. That's perfect. Thank you. Go on ahead. Okay. okay. So, um, just to finish off that bit around social enterprises and the impact they have. Um, we also spread ourselves across many different sectors, some I think just um, from education, employment and skills, business support, hospitality and tourism, as we've already heard about this morning, all our members are involved in all those sectors and uh, the, uh, what social enterprises do around creating employment and addressing social exclusion, working with those furthest from the labour force, working with the most vulnerable in society, old people, young people. Um, and enhancing communities. I think um, just wanted to highlight that before I get into the current issues which are facing the sector. So in terms of where we are at the moment, um, we, um, our members currently are not able to access the business support grants nor the retail hospitality grants. 
um, mainly because most of our members are uh, not paying rates. Now, we did a survey recently and 9% of our members consider it, consider a low survey, consider themselves eligible. So there are some that pay this, but the vast majority, um, which includes um, those that definitely believe they, they aren't eligible, and those that um, don't believe they are or don't know, there's 87, 88% and that, which ties in very closely with the Belfast Chamber of Commerce survey, which we were we were part of and the work will be done um, uh, around about uh, charities and social enterprises um, not as it were for the grant. So that, that's an important thing, thing just to note at this stage. But what we're looking for really is clarity. We as businesses um, operate as businesses. We, um, we don't believe that um, whenever the business support grants were initially set out, that it was intentional that social enterprises would fall foul of a technicality. We don't believe that was intended. I believe that the, the emphasis, the true emphasis behind the UK government and Chancellor's statement and the executive was that uh, these interventions were aimed very specifically at keeping people in employment and keeping businesses alive. Um, the, we call, we're calling as a matter of urgency on the fact that we get the jobs um, those people in the social enterprise sector, which is, our survey shows about 25,000. Um, the survey we did this past few few days has shown that without any further assistance, almost 50% of those organisations will close and don't believe their business will survive by the end of June. 30% by the end of May, cumulative, and up to 50% by the end of June. So those are staggering figures. There are 12 to 12, 12,000 people by the end of June that could be out of to be out of the job. So it's very important that um, we look at um, supporting the social enterprise sector. Social enterprises are businesses, as I have said, but those businesses um, employ people who are furthest from the labour market, and that creates issues as well, because we have people who, um, with learning disabilities um, who don't understand why they're not allowed to go to their work, who don't understand social distancing. Social distancing itself creates issues for people who would run the likes of businesses that employ these people that um, when you do come back it's going to be very difficult to explain to them the social distancing two meter rule as well so there are huge issues um, so suppose just to finish my bit before I open up the questions is um, we really get three asks of, of, of committee at the moment and the first one is around um, immediate access to the business support grants that, are, that all our sectors have as businesses we don't believe that we were meant to be excluded and believe it's a technicality and we're looking for that to be uh, addressed uh, as a matter of urgency to protect cash flow and cover the core costs of our businesses. We're now looking for, we look endlessly across the other parts of the UK and we're, we look at the Welsh um, Economic Resilience Fund and the Scottish Fund, but in the medium term, um, and the base of this may last for some time, we need some sort of resilience fund that's going to help us uh, maintain liquidity, cash flow, and it's helped to um, create uh, and build a sector which uh, adds so much to society, adds so much to the work of society that actually um, is working um, and bringing people into employment that otherwise would be on the benefit system or would be um, costing the National Health Service more funds. So our, bus our businesses do bring people into employment that otherwise wouldn't, wouldn't get a role. But also we're very keen. We believe that going forward in the future, we can't do business the way we always have done business. It needs to change. And I think there is a mindset change amongst everybody and the general public as well. That We're now in a situation that going forward, we need to pivot on how we operate. We need to look at um, being more entrepreneurial, but we need to look at more local. We need to look at actually helping society um, and those that are worse off in society and just pulling together. So we're, we're calling for social enterprise Northern Ireland to be part of a, a, an economic task force going forward that will look at how a new Northern Ireland economy will, will be set up. And on that basis, we're also linking into our sister organisations across the UK, in England, um, Scotland and Wales, um, and just looking at how we can put together a paper and a, uh, to go forward uh, a positive situation. Let's use this time now to be positive. Let's use this time now to strategize. There are lots of issues and lots of lots of concerns and there are health issues and there's business issues. But there's an opportunity now here to look at how, how have we done business in the past and what hasn't worked and how can we actually look to improve going forward to make a more inclusive uh, society. So that sort of 
I could say more, but I think um, judging on the basis of time, Chair, maybe that that's maybe open up at this stage. That's great, Colin. Thank you very much. And I think you have you have um, quite uh, succinctly pointed out the the importance, I suppose, of many of the, of the social enterprises that we have here and the, the very um, the key roles that they play in community and some of, some of the people that are, that are supported through those. Um, and I think very much that need to be supported in the, in the work they do, and we need to see some intervention. Um, in the paper that you had sent to us, you, you had highlighted um, out why some um, are exempt from paying rates. Um, and I suppose if you can maybe offer some reflection on maybe the, the businesses that have been able to access it, and then um, how, because you have said here, you know, a potential mechanism to release the support, um, how that might be done. Okay, sorry, I, I missed a bit at the end there. I think it might have been a door closing or something, Chair, so I'm sorry about that. But I think you were asking around about um, those that maybe have been eligible to apply for. Um, well, our survey that we, we got back in, only 8 or 9% of those have applied. So um, feedback, from, feedback from the sector is that um, those that have applied have um, worked straight on the ball. We provided a lot of support in, in the weeks leading up to the application process, we we um, we host weekly Zoom calls for all our members, and we also have a specific one on the furloughing scheme, so um, and the business business support schemes as well. So um, that information was provided widely provided to our members through um, emails, uh, mail merges, and uh, social media as well. So anybody who was eligible had lined themselves up in good time to apply, um, and I believe. Some, most of those are now starting to filter through. I missed the second part, I think, because somebody closed the door, Chair, so apologies for that. So it's just asking about the, the mechanism that you have in the paper in terms of um, allowing some of those who may have the exemption to um, to apply to the scheme. Um, and I suppose we, uh, like I, I have reflected on it a bit as like the, the de-rating um, exemption and that they were able to use then the, the NAV um, of the business <coughs> Before the exemption was applied. Sorry, yes, sir. Um, we we looked at um, you know if the issue is around um, those that aren't paying rates at the moment, um, we believe that there is a, a system that that can be used to um, to um, assess and provide that support. And the the theory we came up with was that. Every every property in Northern Ireland will be assessed and will have an NAV. Um, at that stage, uh, there is a, a claim put into or a request put in to be um, exempt from paying those rates. So we believe somewhere in the system within Department of Finance there must be a list of those properties that have become exempt. And we put forward a proposal that if you take the list of those properties that are not paying rates and you can cross-reference that against uh, a company size for charities commission. And then back it up with um, looking at the mixture that they are trading and the mixture they look up at their last um, set of annual accounts that have been submitted and company size. And also even look at uh, PAYE systems to make sure they are still paying, paying, paying the wages to, to their staff. So we do believe that um, whilst we're using the rate system as a means of getting money to out, um, we appreciate that that had to be done as a... Uh, to, to impact most businesses within the within the, the economy, but we do believe that social enterprises, there is a means of getting money out to them at this stage, and we would be our proposal will be put forward within the paper that I sent the committee, is one that we believe is currently being looked at by department, but um, we haven't heard anything back from that. And Colin, can I just ask, does the, does the department have a list of registered social enterprises that they should be um, able to I would, kind of align? I would say not, Chair. Um, they, they would. I think they only would have a list of um, those properties, which I'm sure there's a list of those properties which aren't paying rates that that were assessed, but they're no, but they're no longer paying rates. Um, there will be no no list of social enterprises held by them. No, I wouldn't have thought so. Okay, thank you. Um, I'm going to open it up then for questions. Okay. Oh, is this? Yeah, yeah. So, Gordon, you're first. Thanks, Chair. Thanks very much for your presentation. It's been very informative. And I think we'd pass on our thanks, Colin, to all that have been involved in helping out in the recent crisis. Uh, 
organisations, obviously, you know, under your umbrella, have done a, a great job and continue to do a great job in their local community. So I think it's important we register our support for what they've done and what they're endeavouring to do. Um, Thank you. The, the point has been made, obviously, in um, the furlough scheme. How effective has that been for, for staff? <clears throat> Gordon, the, thanks for the question. The, the furlough scheme, um, I suppose by the nature, by the nature of um, social enterprises and the work that they're doing with those that are most vulnerable, there was a bit of a reticence at the start when furlough um, first appeared, but um, they were balancing off furloughing their staff and being still a, an operative within three or four months against not being able to carry out the social mission because we know those people that are furloughed aren't able to uh, work. Yeah. Um, so that was that was because of the because of the nature of social enterprises that was a concern to them at the start. Having said that, um, they now uh, I keep referring to this survey, but it is literally hot off the press with 172 responses. So it's pretty pretty up to date and pretty accurate. The survey asked, um, "Have you uh, furloughed staff at this stage?" Um, and are you considering? So we got a total of around 70% that have said they were furloughing um, and, or were considering to do it. Those that were considering to do it, I believe, were in the, the, uh, the earlier part that I mentioned about um, you know, still having work to do to support those that are furthest from, from the labour force and most vulnerable in society and working with them. But I think, I think um, those that have applied... Um, and I go back to the point about the information we provided. We we were very um, detailed in uh, the, re, the information we provided our members. We had a specific furloughing call where members could come on and ask the experts of what exactly it meant. And that raised a lot of questions. We well, got the answers to those questions. So I think from the scheme being open, feedback has been that <clears throat> those that those that have been looking to furlough have been um, reasonably uh, positive, and I think what we need to be, what we're going out today with, is just a quick reminder that uh, midnight tonight, if you want your money in by the 30th of April, you need to be need to be on the ball, and you need to have those in by the by midnight tonight. So um, I think the feedback has been reasonably good. Um, we are very welcome. We do welcome as a sector. I don't want to be sitting here. Um, thinking that um, we're complaining about the support that's being given out there. All we're just asking for is that social enterprises get the same parity and uh, support that all our businesses are getting. Okay, that's grand. Thank you. Thanks, Chair. Thank you. John Stewart. Thank you, Chair. Collins, John Stewart here. Hi, John. Good to see you. Um, thanks for your presentation and everything you've said so far. I mean, you know, we're all, myself included, are big supporters of the sector, and it is um, integral that we support it at in every way we can, um, especially given the impact it will have on the local community, given the amount of potentially vulnerable people and people who maybe wouldn't normally be tapped into the employment market that are supported by the sector. So it is deeply concerning when you talk about those figures of potential unemployment. Um, I've talked to you about the Welsh resilience model. Um, it does open up to social enterprise, social enterprises in Wales, and I think we're, our companies here are looking on envy. Do you think that's something that should be ruled out here in terms of the grants and opening it wide up to the sector? Um, yeah, I suppose we always looked. We always looked to Northern Ireland very ambitiously across with our colleagues in Scotland. And Scotland has a huge support, huge government support for the social enterprise sector. A specific cabinet minister who looks after it. Whenever Wales produced theirs a few weeks ago, um, we felt it was it was a better scheme because it was it, it was an economic resilience scheme. And that scheme at the time actually mentioned um, in its headlines that it was available, social enterprises were available to um, to use the scheme. So we looked at that and we looked at the breakdown. Now, it, it's available. The, the, way it, the way it's purposed at the moment is that if you're only able to access the um, business grant scheme that this scheme is sitting, it's available as a 500, 500 million scheme. 100 million of it was around development loans, and the other 400,000 was split into two tranches of 200, 200 million each. Which were, um, I think, the reason for that was just to see they didn't want to put it all out at once, so it all went. So it was like a staged, staged relief. But I think the Welsh government hasn't recognised that social enterprises have a, a part to play in the Welsh economy. It's important that um, they were recognised through that. So we, we, we do look at that scheme, and we, we do look at that resilience fund, and we do think that it's one that. Um, 
our officials in, in Northern Ireland should should look at and should should have a um, look to replicate and to assist not only the social enterprise sector but other sectors as well. Thanks, Carl. Thank you, um, Claire. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, good morning, um, I, I suppose I was quite taken by your comments around what we need to do looking forward whenever we emerge uh, from this and how we do business. And I suppose one of the things that occurs to me working with social enterprises within my own constituency, that if you are applying for government funding you know, through their various schemes that you hope to deliver, one of the issues that I have found within uh, social enterprises and community and voluntary sector generally is that they discourage you in having reserves and that in itself would suggest, you know, we're now in a situation where a lot of businesses would be in a good position had they had reserves. And it, ma it makes good business sense. And indeed, social enterprises themselves, you know, are, are, are there to operate like a business and, and to try and have that backup and that safety net. And, and, and I think it's, if anything, that's what's become so apparent to me in all of this. And, you know, I, I agree with your comments that I think, or I hope at least anyway, that one of the, re you know, it, it, I don't think the government intended to exclude social enterprises, um, but because of the technicality of around being designated as a charity, there was an assumption that your funding would still continue, but that isn't obviously the case. So I suppose um, my questions are, are just be interested to hear your comments around uh, just, just good business approach and practice and how the current systems um, uh, from the government almost hinder you in being able to have reserves so that if there is a rainy day like there is at, at the moment, you will be able to, to continue on for at least three to six months um, without fear of, of, of closing and then things can resume. Because I, I think, to be honest, we've been quite short-sighted in, in good business approach um, when it comes to government funding for programmes. And I, I think now this is revealing to be an issue. Yes, thank, thanks, Claire, for the question. It's a, it's a, it's a very good point, and it's one that um, social enterprises probably grapple with from time to time. Um, we, we, we as an organisation, um, focusing on the fact that social enterprises are businesses, have been encouraging uh, members over the years to move away from the grant reliance of a traditional charity and develop into a business and trade as a business. And those that have done that and those that have been successful in doing that are probably those at the moment that are sitting in most danger, that they don't have the, the grant relief to fall back on. They're losing the income from the trading. So they, you know, that is sort of nearly, it's, uh, it hasn't, uh, the fact that they've been innovative and entrepreneurial has actually gone against them at this stage. And you're quite right, the position of reserves within social enterprises. Um, social enterprises, um, by their nature, uh, profits will be regenerated into um, their social mission and to help those people who are further from employment and to spend the money that way. So um, it's, it's, it's a balancing act and it's one that organisations, um, I think that this, this uh, crisis, this pandemic has really shown that that needs to be addressed going forward and the people now start to look at having good business sense um, and like three to six months reserves in stock. Um, a, lot of them, a lot of them probably do. But there are, um, especially those startup ones that maybe maybe are in, not, not even an income generation stage at this stage, and probably young entrepreneurs are concerned with at this, at this stage as well. We have many social enterprise sector. The social enterprise business model appeals so much to young people. They they believe that this is the way forward. This, the millennials believe this is a new way of doing business, and our focus going forward is to be working with young people. But those that have set up social enterprises in the past year or so um, who are um, struggling to create, generate any sort of income out of it at, at the moment and are on the climb. Uh, this has hit them very, very badly, and my concern is that young people will um, be uh, forced away from the sector because of it. But reserves is something that the, the, the business model needs to look at and needs to address going forward. Yes, yeah, so I, I think so, because um, I suppose the government looks towards the community involuntary sector and social enterprise to deliver uh, their programmes to be able to, in terms of outcomes. So the thing that always strikes me is that they they almost don't want to provide the funding if they say that you have a healthy reserve. And you know that in itself almost goes against where we are now, because 
businesses then can't continue to operate if they do find themselves in a difficult position as, as they do now. I know a number of the social enterprises that I work with would get funding from the public sector, but that's to provide a service like any other procurement yep. process would. Um, yep. But they're digging into the, the detail in terms of their bank accounts to see if there's if there's any money there, and if there is, well, why are we giving you more? And I I, I think we need to rethink this if, if we are looking <clears> at the community <throat> and providing these services. Yeah, you're quite right, and there there is a there is a, a fear from members, as you say, that um, if they are doing well and they, they they try to build and stockpile to build reserves, mm. that that'll be looked upon. Um, and might impact any other support that they might be getting because a lot of funding, whilst a lot of social enterprises have moved from grant reliance into trading, there it tends to be a business model that has a blend and a, a cocktail of funding, um, mm. some some grants and some some trading. So it's definitely something that we would we would welcome. Okay, thank, thank you. you. Um, Thanks, John Claire. O'Dowd, do you have a question? Hello. Hello, can you hear me now? Yeah, yeah, go oh, yeah, ahead. Yeah, yeah. yeah, thank you. Uh, and thank you very much for your, your presentation, Colin. Some of this has been covered in, in Claire's previous commentary because uh, there is a blend there of, of, of different functions and categories many of your, your enterprises fall into. Have you had any direct engagement with the Minister? And if so, what feedback are you giving in relation to a scheme to, to support <clears throat> your enterprises moving forward? And are you hopeful, perhaps, that the money that has come forward for charities may be used to support your enterprises? Thank you. Thank you, John. Um, taking the second part of that question first, we believe that the funding available under the Barnet Consequentials for, for Northern Ireland, um, my understanding from the conversations I've been having with departments is that, um, and also the guys across in the UK, but mainly from local departments locally, is that, that fund, those funds will drop into the Department of Finance and will be used as part of a fund to help the wider charity and social enterprise sector. Um, so I think it's something that um, uh, those funds may be used and social enterprises may benefit from that. Um, the first part of your question, could you repeat again? I've, I've lost that one. I was, I was asking, have you had any engagement with the minister? Oh, yeah. Directly in regard to some what feedback have you got? Yeah, we have um, we've been lobbying extensively since since early March. Um, the minister very kindly attended our social enterprise conference on the, the March in, in Crumlin Road Jail. That was actually the morning after the Fly B was announced, and we're delighted that, that she came along to that. So since that, we've been engaging with the department um, through um, asking questions on behalf of our members and asking. Um, writing letters, just look, seeking what I'm asking here today, looking for support. We've been doing it now probably for probably for three weeks or so, um, just asking on an ongoing basis for support for the sector. Um, we have put a request in to to have a video call with a Zoom call or whatever, Skype with, with the minister, and we, we're hopeful that we will get that response to that over the next few days. So we're just very keen um, that... Minister of Finance, Minister for Economy, are all very aware of just what the issues are on the front line. And, um, yeah, we, we hope to hear in the next few days where that a meeting will be set up with the Minister for Economy. Thank you. And I think um, DFC has a role in terms of the, the charitable, um, the, the money that's available for yeah. that as well, in terms of designing what that might look like. Um, I have a couple of comments here, Colin, that um, members have sent in via our, our group WhatsApp. Um, Sinead McLaughlin has said she doesn't have a question, but she would just like to reflect she's highly supportive of the sector and the societal value nature of the work and believes that they should enjoy quality of support. And Gary Middleton has also sent in through a, a comment saying, agrees with the comments of other members, the social enterprise sector plays a significant role in the NI economy and it's important that we keep up the engagement over the coming weeks. And I think that's something that, that we, we all agree on. I think you have highlighted some of the real challenges in terms of what you're facing um, and the type of work that, that is being done. And I think that, that the different models, I suppose, of, of work um, of supporting communities, of, of supporting um, workers through cooperatives, those type of, of models are things that we, we, we will all be looking towards in, in the new economy kind of setup that we, we've been talking about. And it has been oh, a Peter, really Peter, Peter. 
Somebody's talking? Yes? Might be Sinead to her husband. <laughs> Hello, yes, Peter? Yes, Hi, Chair. Can I just make a comment? Yes, go ahead. Okay. Um, Colin, thank you very much for the presentation. i tell you what I, I would like to just uh, kind of bring your attention to. There's quite a bit of fundraising going on for the National Health Service charities um, throughout the whole of the UK, and there's a significant amount of money coming from Northern Ireland to, to those charities. It is my understanding that we have no National Health Charities here in Northern Ireland um, that will benefit from um, that fundraising, which is fairly significant uh, amount of money. We have been pushing the National Health Charities in order for them to register some um, some of the charities and I would say some of the social economy businesses here in Northern Ireland to be part of uh, the UK-wide charitable assistance. Now, for example, like Partnership Care West, which is here in the North West, that is supporting uh, the National Health Service and is part of the Bryson House Group, and I think, you know, you probably should nearly look into the other uh, social economy businesses that we have and see if you can get them registered up to the National Health uh, Service charities because I think there's a significant amount of money going in and none coming to Northern Ireland. Okay, Shinnit, thank you very much. I wasn't aware of that. So uh, I'll certainly happy to take that up after the call. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. To, to additionally say that um, we, we'll be taking everything that you have said to us today and, and reflecting it back to, to the department as well. Um, and um, just thank you very much for taking the time to talk to us this morning. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Colin. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks, Colin. Bye. Um, I think Peter, again, it was um, really useful. I think there are points out of that that, that we maybe can be reflecting back. Um, and maybe maybe we should also um, reflect the Colin's comments there and ask that the minister does um, do that engagement with them as soon as possible. Chair, what might also be helpful is, as um, members have already discussed the idea of doing a subsequent um, Microsoft Teams meeting either Friday or Monday, is obviously we have the minister up um, to the committee in, in virtual form of some form um, next week. And if we can gather together uh, a number of these issues, the Minister might then be able to respond to them. Yeah, perhaps we could um, write specifically yeah. though on that point yeah. about um, about the that meeting. Yes, yeah. absolutely, absolutely. Yeah, we 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 sort that out. Okay. Um, if you want to go ahead. And... Yes, thank you. Um, so we're moving on then to, to matters arising, and there's a fair few. Um, so if members refer to page fifty four of their pack, um, there is. A response from the department in relation to the the request members will recall about the viewable meeting or media uk limited um the the screens that were being put in, in shops and things like that um that has subsequently um collapsed um if members are content to note the response and address the issue again at the briefing from the small business commissioner which is to be rescheduled at the resumption of normal business um, it might also be useful if we shared that response with um, Tweed and I, I think, yeah. had had contacted a number of members about it. Yeah. Um, so then moving on to 7.2, at page 56 of the pack, um, there is um, quite a lengthy correspondence um, from the House of Lords EU Internal Market Subcommittee regarding its inquiry into the UK EU negotiations on level playing field and state aid. Um, it was a really informative letter as well and I think um, potentially we should ask the department to look at how it intersects with the protocol yeah. um, and then reflect that back to us. I know we're doing some more work around around the, the protocol in the time ahead so that would be really useful. Yeah, no, there's, there's a lot of crossover there, Chair. Yeah. Um, then yeah. moving on to 7.3, on page 82 there's a response from Ulster University um, to the request for clarification on the planned location of the health sciences provision and the consultation that was taking place. Um, if members have any uh, actions to note or are content to note for now. Great. Yeah, okay. Okay. Um, then 7.4 and 7.5, there are responses from um, Belfast Chamber and from Newry Chamber on pages 85 and 88. Um, we are due to have our briefing from the Minister next week. Um, are members content to raise the issues that have been highlighted to us? Um, at that meeting? Yeah. Yep. Thank you. Um, and we are also 
seeking to um, ask members if they would be content for us to get briefings from the chambers um, on the 6th of May meeting. Yeah. 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 Okay. Thank you. Um, By link? Or <laughs> I think we're going to stick with the tally reference yeah. thing. Yeah. It seems to be more reliable. Um, that's, that's the intention? Yeah, and the sound, just everybody gets the sound better. That's good. Um, then uh, there is a written briefing from the Federation of Small Businesses um, at um, page 92 of your packs. Um, we are scheduled to get an oral briefing from FSB next week, so our members can tend to note ahead of that briefing. Great. Um, then number nine um, on the agenda is a written briefing from Enterprise NI. Um, our members can tend to note that unless there's any other actions to be suggested. Um, there's also a written briefing from Endertrade Ireland on page 103. Um, we are also planning to get a briefing from them um, once we kind of return to more normal business. Or even before yeah. that, Chair. It's, before that. It's, um, I think now that we have started our flow of meetings and we've got a system to work with, um, we just start yeah, scheduling. Things. Yeah, yeah. Um, these inputs, sorry, Chair, have they been put forward to the department or maybe these groups already? A lot of what we're getting, Chair, is either already with the department or is yeah. um, being forwarded by us. So anything we get, they have to share. Yeah. Um, but what we found is a lot of them are being sent to the department and then copied to us. Um, we've tried to encourage as many organisations as possible to let us know if they're sending anything to the minister so we just know what's reached private office yeah. so that we can reinforce anything or we can bring in people for briefing, etc. Just so we're keeping a momentum on that. Yeah. Um, and I, I do think it's important that we encourage people to communicate yeah. with us because obviously there's a lot yeah. of issues currently and, and it's good for us to be aware of them. So it, sure, I think we'll try and ramp up the social media on that, our Twitter feed and so on. We, we haven't got our Facebook thing off the ground yet that will probably have to wait till resumption and we can get the input from comms and so on but we will certainly make good use of the twitter feed um so moving on then to item number 11 which is correspondence um at page 107 of your pack there is a letter from the minister regarding technical amendments to legislation dealing with guarantees of origin for electrically produced high efficiency cogeneration um are members content with what's being suggested Great. Yep. Thank you. Um, Eleven point two. There's correspondence on page one hundred nine from the director's department of finance on the excess vote caused by the payment of the small business grant. Um, I think there is no other viable alternative other than to yep. accept the, the excess vote. So are members content with that? Great. Yep. Um, at page one hundred and ten, there is a correspondence from the committee for finance regarding the budget process. Um, the Committee for Finance has sought agreement of all statutory committees to participate in a standardised process for statutory committee scrutiny of the executive budget 2020-21. Budget um, the committee forwarded the pro forma to the department and we've now had a response. We've had our response, Chair, if I can just jump in there. So we, we've had a response on the budget pro forma. We've also had the um, COVID-19 resource allocations across all departments that those were sent out to members already. Uh, we've now had the scrutiny paper from research. So what we do is we, we bring all those together and potentially that's a, a, a further discussion to be had when we do a, a committee call because yeah. um, there's a lot of information there. A lot. But a lot has now been um, effectively, if you like, knocked out of play by the, the transfer of funds to the COVID-19 crisis and the repurposing of funding. Yeah, and actually I think that that might be something that we want to explore with the department um, in terms of asking them some questions about have they seen reduced pressures perhaps in terms of um, the departmental budget yeah. due to the crisis um, and plans then to, to reallocate spending um, within the department's budget and um, to other areas yeah. and, and yeah. In also responding to COVID-19. I think that's something that, that we maybe should explore. We will do, Chair. We, we try and get that organised as well and get that into a schedule. Okay. Um, then 11.4, there's correspondence at page 111 from the Committee for Finance regarding the in-year monitoring revised arrangements. Um, if the Committee agree ahead of its scrutiny of monitoring rounds to forward any reallocation of funding within the Department either to or from COVID-19 work, 
which um, or which exceeds the normal one million de minimis limit. Are members content? Great. Yeah. Um, 11.5 then, there's correspondence on page 115 um, from the Committee for Finance on written evidence from a senior yeah. Ulster University still there. economist um, to the House of Commons NI Affairs Committee inquiry on the new decade, new approach agreement. Are members content with that or have they any action? Great. Content, yeah. Um, 11.6, there's correspondence on page 125 of your packs. From the Committee for Infrastructure regarding financial pre pressures on the logistics um, sector. Um, are members content to forward that to the Department um, for, for comment? I think um, the issues there are being highlighted are being highlighted by FTA. And yeah. Um, it, it's I know I, like I've raised it with the Minister, so I'm sure that the Department is. I think the Department has had everything that we've already had, but it yeah. doesn't hurt to, to send it on again with a committee letter. Yeah. Um, then at page 130 of your pack, there's correspondence from the Committee for Justice regarding the LCM on Private International Law Bill. Um, are members content to forward this to the Department for confirmation of the responsibilities of the bill that will be placed on the Department? Great. Yeah. Chair, that bill has now um, published, so we know a little bit more, and I'll give members a bit more feedback on that in the next couple of days as okay. well. Okay, that's great. Um, um, 11.8, then there's correspondence from NIRIG um, at page 138 about the, the resp uh, its response to the energy call for evidence. Um, and we are planning to have a roundtable event in terms of the energy strategy um, one, in the next maybe month or so. Yeah, we, we, Chair, we'll try and work out a format for those yeah. um, Obviously more so we can go that. ahead and I don't think it's a thing you could do well with teleconferencing. So we're, we're going to be stretching our imaginations mm. um, as to how well we can do that. Um, we, we might just have to fall right back on sending out questions um, and asking people to respond, putting out a general call across social media. Yeah, so there's a, that's, it's a very comprehensive response there yeah. um, as well. But it might be useful to, to ask the, com or the department about the time frame now for the next yes. steps in terms of... The, the energy strategy in the consultation. Yeah. Um, and then moving on to 11.9, um, page 188 of your pack, there is um, a press release from NI Chamber and Industry and um, BDO regarding the survey. Um, are members content to note that unless there's any other actions? I think we have asked for, we've had correspondence yeah. with them as well. Um, also, Chair, to flag up again, um, for members, um, members had talked about seeking um, uh, economic modelling. Um, yeah. Our understanding is that the minister is already looking at that and is going to share what the department gets with us. I think they've approached Neil Gibson already, so um, hopefully we'll be able to share that and it'll, it'll give us the kind of economic modelling going forward that we're looking for. Yeah. No, and then a page, uh, sorry, 191 of your pack is this survey of the summary from the Chamber of yeah. Commerce. So that completes our correspondence. Then we're moving on to any other business. Here, yeah, just to, to summarise all the issues that was raised today, how do you intend to bring those forward? So, Chair, what we'll do is, as I say, we'll, we'll bring together a paper highlighting everything. If we get members together, then either probably Friday or Monday to do the, the video call. Well, Teams thing, because yeah. people like a bit, yeah. Um, we'll discuss finding that down, and then we can share it with the department in terms of seeing the minister next week, um, or hearing the minister next week, and we'll go from there, but we'll, we'll bring it into a member discussion um, on Teams mm -hmm. in the next few days, and it'll just mean members can add input and have a bit of time to think again about what we've heard today, mm -hmm. but we'll capture all this um, in a, a paper with points mm -hmm. and see where members want to go. And maybe members could potentially look at that for Friday to... To get that mm -hmm. we'll get that out as fast as possible and then we we canvas for availability yeah. for a team's call. Yeah, Chair, can I raise another issue too? Just out of what we heard today, this ten grand grant thing, while it while it is obviously a massive intervention from government, it's not getting through. Mm -hmm. We raised this in the chamber last week with the minister and we were told it's a small amount percentage wise of businesses that maybe fell through the cracks because of the portal, lack of information, the wrong details. We're hearing from Tourism Alliance today that it's 50% plus of companies who are entitled to it. 
There are retail sectors, major people who were told they were getting it three, four weeks ago. These are companies who are running to stand still on their last legs and they cannot get through to anybody on the phone line. Can we, get, as a committee, get the answers to why there are these delays? Yeah, so in my call with the Minister the other day, um, there was two things just in relation to it. One, she says the applications have slowed down and they haven't reached the level that was being expected, the 27,000 that yeah. um, were el eligible for it, that hasn't, the number of applications hasn't reached that. Um, but also I asked for a point of contact mm -hmm. within mm -hmm. the department for MLAs because yeah. some of the cases we're dealing with now are maybe the more complex yeah. ones or, mm -hmm. or things like you said where there's, there has been delays and they haven't had responses and I thought it would be very useful if MLAs had someone that, that they could ring up aside from the helpline that, that businesses have yeah. or even even an email contact that, that mm -hmm. we are able to, yeah. to get a response yeah. from. Yeah. Uh, and she did say that she would consider that so maybe that's something we should raise we, again course, yeah. via the committee. I can understand if it was people who were had to apply through the portal to log their details, but most of the ones I'm hearing from are people who thought they were entitled to it because they pay by direct debit, their contact details are there, their next door neighbour in the high street has got it and they still haven't even had word. It just seems to me yeah. staggering that we're dealing with this many people still. And um, I, uh, just to, to reflect that we should encourage any businesses who thought they were eligible if they haven't already received it to apply through yeah, the portal to, as uh, well, yeah, just exactly. to, to make sure that they're covering mm -hmm. all bases. But I do think that that contact could be useful. Is that come through yet, Chair? Are we still waiting? We haven't through? received anything, but okay. we press on that, press Chair, on again. That that's got to be part of our Dallow readout. Yeah, I think there are a number of issues on the grants. Um, the non-industrial day rate was, was a big positive mm -hmm. when we got that change. But as I understand it, yeah, it doesn't fit into the 10 to 25 slot. I think it's something we maybe should be pushing for. Yeah, maybe you can note that, Peter, obviously, yeah, but we, uh, uh, we can get that on our, on our report. But I think that's significant. Um, there's also the leisure uh, issue where... Uh, golf clubs, etc., are entitled to apply for uh, a 25k grant, but the rates, um, the amount of rates they're paying is in excess of on the NAV. It's over 51,000 for about half of the golf clubs, and um, a number of them are the rates are so low that they wouldn't even wouldn't be eligible for the 10k either. So that's something I think we need to look at. I think the scheme wasn't designed for them originally. So the, the rating criteria isn't suitable, really, as a, as a way of assessing it. But I think it needs to be looked at. That might, um, just having to think about that previously, the, the, the golf clubs would obviously fall into the leisure industry, which yeah. may now look potentially eligible for what's being offered more widely to hospitality. But I think it's something that needs to be... Pursuit, that right. it's That's been discussed a little bit, but I, there's no there's no set detail on it that I'm aware of. Yeah. So we'll pursue that. Yeah. The other one, just without delaying everybody, um, the multiple sites issue is a problem. Yeah. Um, of businesses, and I think there's there are operators with two or three sites, and they they're hit hard. Yes. I know in Scotland have gone for a reduced rate yeah. for the second site. 75% I understand they get, so I think it's something we should be pushing on yeah. I know well. it's something I've been contacted by and yeah. I'm sure many other members have as well um, and it is going to cause problems because obviously businesses pay rates on all their premises mm -hmm. and they have overheads on all their premises but there has to be a way of finding a balance and I think we, 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 we do need to go to the Chair, department we, on we that. Chair, we flagged that one up and I think, if I'm re recollecting right, that the Minister has acknowledged yes. the mm -hmm. issue um, mm -hmm. and is having officials look at that. As you say, Mr Dunn, there's a, a system already being operated um, in another region in that Scotland. talks yeah. about how you can do this on a phase basis. And I yeah. had heard some discussion here around that. So it might be a case of having a proposal. What we do is we look at that Scottish system so that we have written detail. And we yeah. can, again, bring that back to members and see if they're happy to pursue that as a model with mm. the department. Yeah. Okay. The social enterprises needs to be highlighted yeah. more. I think needs a bit more of an emphasis on it. I think we didn't maybe all realise yeah. the difficulties that there are, are having. We, we make assumptions that they're rate free in a lot of cases, which, you know, in the main is the case for the, when it comes to shops and so on. But they obviously have all their overheads and they're limited on the furlough scheme because a lot of the work is done part time or on a voluntary yeah. basis. And also, 
they've had to continue working to help out in the crisis. So those are issues we think we need to address. Thanks, Chair. Thank you. Um, I think that's it for now, that's unless for anybody's now. anything else. Um, so moving then to item number 13, which is the date, time and place of the next meeting, which is next Wednesday in room 30. Um, Chair, we, we go again for this room because we've booked it. Um, I think the Senate has already booked out, but if members are condemned, we'll, we'll just fall back to teleconferencing because it just seemed to work just better. work better and the sound quality was better. Yep. Um, thank you to members that are on the teleconference. Uh, we're now going to cut feed, okay? Committee room 30. Okay, thank you. This is the Northern Thanks, Ireland sir. Assembly Committee room 